everyone. Uh, welcome to the final panel of uh, Decentering German Cinema. Um, this panel is titled Conceptual Decentering, um, the last of a great series of panels over the last two days. Um, I'm Paul DeBryden. I uh, am an assistant professor at the University of Virginia, where I teach um, in the German department here, um, and mostly film classes. And I am moderating because I would have been here anyway, and I'm glad to reduce uh, the workload of Ervin and Nicole, however, slightly. Um, so then thank you to uh, Ervin and Nicole also for organizing this, this great event. So um, we can take questions throughout the panel. Feel free to use the Q&A function um, as our speakers are speaking, and we'll collect questions and um, address them all at the, or, you know, However, given our you know, time limit, uh, however many we can, um, at the end after everyone has presented. Um, and I will introduce our presenters uh, uh, in turn before they speak. Okay, so um, our first presenter is Tom Hawkinson. He's Associate Professor at California College of the Arts in San Francisco. Uh, he's co-editor of the book series, Visual Cultures and German Contexts, and has co-edited several anthologies including Jürgen Habermas and the European Economic Crisis, Cosmopolitanism Reconsidered, Representations of German Identity, as well as the forthcoming How to Make the Body, Difference, Identity, and Embodiment. His monograph, Grotesque Visions, The Science of Berlin Dada, will be published in May of 2021 with the Imke Meyer's New Directions in German Studies series. Of note, Hawkinson has received awards and fellowships from the Fulbright Program, the Social Science Research Council, Council, the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science, the Deutsche Akademische Austauschdienst, and the Berlin Program for Advanced German and European Studies, among others. Uh, and Tom's paper today is titled Cinema of Distractions, Decentering Time and Space in quote unquote German avant-garde cinema. Um, and thank you, Tom, welcome. Great, Paul, thank you so much. And, and good to see everybody again. And, and good to be on this really fantastic panel. I know some of the panelists from years, uh, so it's great to be here. And also just a big shout out and thank you to Nicole and to Irvin for really coordinating this wonderful, wonderful event. Uh, like Evan, I have two small beans in my house. Mine are dogs and not kids. <laughs> and apologies uh, if you hear some barking or growling um, I have snacks. I'm trying to occupy them on the sidelines. So um, just so you know, uh, hopefully they're not going to get too disruptive. And I'll, I'll go through my presentation, as I mentioned during the last panel, moderating the last panel. My internet, I think, is in pretty good shape. But if I do cut out, I'll simply keep talking. It's tough for me to know. The one indicator I have is that the recording light is flashing on my screen. So if that freezes, then I know I'm in big trouble. But otherwise, I'll just keep going. And if, if I miss, if you miss something, if I miss something because of the internet uh, connection, just uh, I can go back and, and clarify, perhaps even in our Q&A uh, is needed. All right, thank you so much. I'm gonna share my screen. I have some images, um, but not a robust um, number, no moving images, they're all uh, static. <coughs> so, uh, excuse me. All right, and uh, many things on my screen, there we go, okay. In what follows, I will focus on ways to rethink the foundations of a so-called German cinema in order to decenter the cinema materiality. So I begin by focusing on theories of early 20th century cinema as one of attraction or distraction. My goal is just in this brief section is to open up our reading of these terms to more material and physical rather than perceptual or cognitive ends. As such, I focus briefly not only on key theorists employing the terms attraction or distraction in relation to early cinema, but on these terms Latin origins with their emphases on location and on place. Then I turn to two short literary grotesques by what I call inside outsiders of the early 20th century avant-garde in Germany. That is two figures whom I position at the seeming center of the avant-garde scene of the 1920s but who are marginalized within it as well. A German Jewish Bohemian named Solomon Friedlander and a gender non-conforming Dutch lesbian named Till Bruchmann. My point in reading Friedlander's and Bruchmann's literary work about representational materiality at a conference devoted in great part to film's presumptive visuality is to showcase the efforts of these inside outsiders to disrupt ideas 
already taking habitual hold in the early 20th century about cinema's seemingly natural association with national identity. Put reductively, Friedlander and Brugman's literary works argue that there is no material affinity between cinema or film and national identity as such. No German identity or Germanness inherent to the idea of cinema. Instead, they use cinema and its signifiers, mechanical projection, celluloid representation, to disrupt such ideas. To these ends, I conclude my presentations by noting that these two polymorphic literary examples from the realm of the avant-garde show us how the potential contours of a cinema of material distraction, always potentially in a different time and always potentially in a different place, purposefully and always never quite German. In straining our vision to see a distinction between cinema as national ideology and cinema as filmic materiality, a counter narrative begins to emerge in cinematic theories of the avant garde. This counter narrative is not Tom Gunning's idea of cinema of attraction or attractions, but rather one that constructively embraces Siegfried Krakauer's ideas concerning mass distraction and Walter Benjamin's theory of reception in distraction, almost literally, a cinema of distractions, as it were. I want to point to the physical dimensions of attraction and distraction and the con Tom, are you there? I am. I'm back. I'm sorry about that internet glitch. I'll, I'll continue. And see. Okay, I think we're good. So I want to point to the physical dimensions of attraction and distraction in the context of these authors' material histories. Attraction and distraction were more than descriptors of perpetual seduction, perceptual seduction for these and other film theorists. Forms of sensory overload, seemingly impossible to ignore and even harder to avoid in the robust dynamic, urban dynamics of Weimar Germany. The focus on terms like attraction and distraction with their seemingly optical perceptual biases might be seen another way, however. Etymologically speaking, these terms, attraction and distraction, also reveal the ways in which an artistic disruption can call into question physical, geographical, even national presuppositions. Tom Gunning's later descriptions of an early cinema of attraction seems to oddly prefigure Siegfried Krakauer's and Walter Benjamin's earlier fascination with mass media in an age of distraction. Gunning, of course, begins his highly influential essay, The Cinema of Attractions, Early Film, Its Spectator and the Avant-Garde, first published in 1975, by quoting the artist Ferdinand Legere. The appeal of the new art of cinema for Legere, Gunning reminds us, quote, did not lay in imitating the movements of nature or, in, or the, in the mistaken path of its resemblance to theater, its unique power was a matter of making images seen, end quote. While Gunning's focus is on film made prior to 1906, the Legere essay that he quotes is from the early 1920s and bears a title with significance to the materialist theory of my argument, a critical essay on the plastic quality of Abel Gantz's film, The Wheel. Gunning, of course, is not the only person to have written on the material problems and potentials of film in early 20th century Germany. Siegfried Krakauer's essay, Cult of Distraction, on Berlin's picture palaces from 1926, negatively describes the large picture palaces as optical fairylands, in contrast to smaller movie theaters or kinos. Krakauer goes further, romanticizing the small neighborhood movie houses claiming the optical fairylands are literally, quote, changing the face of Berlin, end quote, in the negative. The city, in short, is being remade not simply in narrative content, but rather also in viewing form. The superficial facades of large-scale film houses are moving the masses, distracting them away from the more intimate neighborhood film venues, the kinos. In a related work, albeit one in a more positive vein, Walter Benjamin, in the second version of his essay, the work of art in the age of its technological reproducibility, written in 1935 and 36 and unpublished in Benjamin's lifetime, that is the second version of that essay, repeatedly refers to the media of photography and film. 
any means suggest an aesthetic mobility that I think too often is conflated with conceptual and cultural significance at the expense of the physical and geographic effect. That is the effect of these modern mechanical media forms. He reminds us after all, not only that quote, that technological reproduction is more independent of the original reproduction can place the copy of the original in situations I lost you again there, Tom. Uh, I'm sorry about that. I have everything shut down. It's um, it's got to be the dogs jumping on. They're, they're searching on the Wi-Fi for something. I think. So talking a little bit about Benjamin's uh, second essay, the second version of the essay, uh, the work of art essay, and in particular these suggestions that technological reproduction can place the copy of the original artwork in situations which the original itself cannot attain. So that's a quote. Film and photography move the artwork, but also the viewer. In other words, move us not only in affective, but also in potentially quite material and literal ways. While Gutting, Krakauer, and Benjamin map out well-known territory with respect to avant-garde and to early cinema, I want to point out that the physical geographic dimensions of attraction and distraction seemingly vanished from the vantage point of contemporary theory. The vanishing is and was no doubt the result of the increasing scientific emphasis on the physiology of perception in Germany during the late 19th and early 20th century. When they thought of attraction or distraction, sense physiologists and critical theorists alike increasingly thought in terms of a perceiving European body here and now, rather than proposing the movement of that body, of a body, and potentially moving this body to another place. But the words distraction and attraction also have in their Latin origins, not exclusively the realm of the optical, but also the realm of the physical. The term distraction comes from the Latin distraho, dis as in away from, and traho as in drag. To distract in this sense is not simply a matter of perception, but also a matter of location. To drag away from, to pull away from. Similarly, the term, attra the term attraction refers in its Latin roots to a spatial as much as to a perceptual phenomenon. From attrahere, ad, and traho, attraction means toward and to drag, respectively or collectively to drag toward. So just emphasizing the physical dimensions of these terms for the purposes of my material investigation into cinema uh, with respect to these two authors' uh, texts. So reframing attraction and distraction in physical rather than strictly optical or cognitive terms is key for rethinking the early 20th century writings of avant-garde artists like Solomo Friedlander. Friedlander, born in Western Poland in 1871, was active in European avant-garde circles, primarily in Berlin in the early 20th century. While he was an avid and sometimes published writer, as his materials at the Deutsches Literaturarchiv in Marbach suggest, his influence on the critical art artistic practices of his day could be considered decidedly more Hi again. Sorry. I think this has got to be the weather. Can you hear me okay? Okay, thank you so much. So talking about Friedlander, attraction and distraction. And uh, his writings mostly unpublished uh, at the time in the Deutsches Literaturarchiv in Marbach. Using the pseudonym Monona, an inversion of the German anonym or anonymous, Friedlander published in a number of avant-garde periodicals. Der Sturm, die Aktion, Jugend und die Weiße Blätter, die Weißen Blätter. Friedlander also co-founded, along with Anselm Rust, the Stirner League in 1919 and the journal Der Einzige, or The Individual, named after Max Stirner's manifesto to anarchism and individualism. Der Einzige und sein Eigentum, translated into English as the individual and in his property. As Timothy O. Benson and others just Friedlander's most lasting impact might be seen philosophy behind the work of artists such as the Dadaists in Berlin and their search for so-called Neue Mensch 
and uh, an, according, an accompanying Neue Gemeinschaft. Yet for all his radical and innovative ideas, Friedlander remained an out inside outsider among his European avant-garde colleagues. Not as transient as the often displaced Jewish Romanian artist, Tristan Zara, who too was the target of racism and anti-Semitism at the hands of his artistic peers. Friedlander was often marginalized because of his Jewish identity, not only causing significant financial hardship, but also experiencing to a great extent, explaining to a great extent why his wide ranging contributions to the artistic community in Germany, especially during the interwar period, remain largely unacknowledged even today. However, Friedlander's notable contributions, which I have detailed as, as um, Paul mentioned in an upcoming book uh, scheduled for May, 2021, uh, called Grotesque Visions, the Science of Berlin Dada, include theoretically loaded literary engagements with German cinema. Friedlander's short grotesque, Fata, 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 sorry, short grotesque, excuse me, Fata Morgana Machina, written in 1920, may be one of his best known works. Ironically enough, thanks to mass media and the contemporary study of it. The essay appears in Friedrich A. Kittler's 1986 media study, Gramophone Film Typewriter. Kittler includes the Fata Morgana Machina, sometimes translated as the Fata Morgana Machine or the Mirage Machine in his section on film, and even more specifically in a discussion of cinema and death. Kittler claims in his analysis of Friedlander's story that the, forgotten, the, the Fata Morgana machine might be read as the death of cinema itself. But in rereading, in a rereading of Friedlander's tale and our contemporary efforts to decenter German cinema, we might find not a death for cinema, but rather a cinema that seeks to take us elsewhere. That is quite literally in the case of this story, to project a place other than here, other than the real Germany, to distract us, as it were, to pull us and to drag us away. In the story, an unusual filmmaker named Abnos, Abnosa Shore, clearly a surrogate for Friedlander himself, obsesses over what he believes to be the most interesting problem of film, that is the, quote, optical reproduction of nature, art, and fantasy, end quote. Shore proposes to achieve this reproduction through the use of a stereoscopic projection apparatus, a Fata Morgana or a Mirage machine that would quote, place its three dimensional constructs into space without the aid of a projection screen, end quote. Shore develops the device. This machine able to create what today we might call holograms is able to project entire cities, Berlin, Potsdam onto otherwise empty landscapes but the physical and geographic magnitude of this perceptual production butts up against a dogmatic association of national identity and physical domination. Shore undeterred shows the minister of the military that indeed his stereoscopic projection device, his mirage machine can even create all those things needed for war and to defend the nation state from battle lines and bombs to aircraft and enemy outposts. Here, of course, Shore celebrates the exceptional benefit of such holographic heroics. These buildings and soldiers of light can be destroyed. The aircrafts can be aircrafts can drop an infinite number of bombs, yet no one really dies. War would no longer mean death. The nation state could thrive without conflict. The minister of the military, however, wholeheartedly rejects Shore's creation, claiming that such fantastic project, project devices, projection devices, might put an end to real war itself. The nation state, it seems, needs to defend its borders through real force to take possession of other territories by spending real blood and ending real lives. A mirage machine, a stereoscopic projection device, does not allow Germany to defend real borders with real bodies. The materiality of warfare of violent conflicts among nations for territory is no match for film fantasy and mirage machines. But perhaps the minister of the military's rejection of Shore's suggestion is precisely Friedlander's point. Put in other words, it is the rejection of Shore's stereoscopic projection device, this mirage machine, his cinema of another kind, that showcases Friedlander's suggestion that cinema has no nationality, that cinema as an illusory media form, one that attracts and distracts, actually pulls us away drags us from the material foundations that uncritically sustain it. Such a reading suggests in contradictions to, to, in contradiction to Hitler that Friedlander is not foreshadowing the death of cinema through warfare, 
but rather the threat of cinema as the death to the nation, as death to the nation state. In contrast to Friedlander's association of cinema and death with national identity, the Dutch provocateur Matilda Petronella, Maria Petronella Bruckman, known as Till, proposes a much more erotic affiliation of national identity and cinematic celluloid. Bruckman was a rare figure in the European art circles of 1920s. An open, openly lesbian woman just went funky on my, my iPad too. My internet is not cooperating with us today, everybody. I apologize on both ends. Um, so I'm gonna reload my device here. Uh, so I, I just was mentioning, I'm giving you a portrait of Till Brugman on the, the left, a photographic portrait from around a 19, probably around 1930, 1932. And then on the right is a portrait that her uh, partner at the time, Hannah Huch, created uh, in 1927. And uh, this artist is, um, uh, uh, a lesser known figure I mentioned, um, and I'm still waiting for my internet to pop up here, my document. Uh, so I'll, I'll say just a little bit. Brookman was actually quite active in the Dutch distill movement in the 1910s and 1920s. This is kind of how she became familiar uh, with all the activities happening in Berlin. And one of the reasons she did uh, migrate to Berlin to pursue some of her literary work. Uh, and she was uh, oftentimes the target of really quite misogynistic and homophobic uh, diatribes by the part of uh, members of the distill movement in, in uh, the Netherlands. And that continued to some extent in Berlin, but some of the um, Theodor van Duisburg, for example, some of the comments uh, that I, I'll quote if the document comes back up, um, focus specifically on her, uh, her gender identification and her sexuality in which he describes her as, as a monster as, uh, as producing, quite frankly, the word is shit and uh, that, that she can't really write. So it's a really not a wonderfully embracive relationship in the avant-garde circles for someone like Brugman. Uh, but once she transitions to Berlin, she discovers, uh, uh, she meets Hannah Huch and works with Salomo Friedlander and begins a, a fairly long-term relationship with Hannah Huch, lasting from the mid 1920s till about 19, till about 1935. Uh, and it ends very abruptly, um, in great part, the general sense among folks who have studied uh, Bruchmann and her relationship to Huch because of the National Socialists and the persecution of same-sex relationships. Um, Bruchmann actually sort of goes into hiding in the Netherlands and Huch stays in Berlin, marries a male friend of theirs, uh, uh, someone they've only known for a brief period of time, and, and Huch remains in Berlin through the war. So um, I'll still try to get my document up here for us, apologies. Um, the story that I wanted to talk about, uh, some of you may have encountered before, called Department Store of Love, Warenhaus der Liebe, in which Brugman serves as the narrator uh, for visitors to a department store uh, where the narrator and the narrator's partner sell objects of sexual gratification of various stripes, all made from celluloid with a Z, celluloid. Uh, and uh, this, this department store is meant to be a parody of uh, Magnus Hirschfeld's um, Institute of Sexual Science. And I've given you a picture here on screen of what was called the Zwischenstufenband. Uh, those of you, I don't know, some of you in this group have studied uh, and worked with Hirschfeld, Hirschfeld already. Um, he actually had a theory that there were something like uh, 17 or 18,000 intermediate stages of sexual and gender development by the time uh, he passed away in the 1930s. Uh, and one of his efforts was then to visually demonstrate uh, this particular, um, these particular stages through pictures on the wall. He was trained as a medical scientist and, and uh, worked in anthropology as well. So the connection there is significant. And I have my document back, it just came up. So I'll continue and I know Evan, I don't wanna take, or, uh, and, uh, Urban and, and Nicole and Paul, I won't take too much more time, I know, uh, to make sure that there's time for others. So I'll just talk a little bit about the short story that I was uh, mentioning from Brookman. 
In her short story, Brookman describes a department store filled with celluloid or plastic objects. And this is a material connection that came up in the last panel. This is why I asked the question about the materiality of film stock. Um, so the term celluloid has a number of, of various uses in the turn of the century and early 20th century. And it's a kind of malleability uh, of terminology and use that a number of avant-garde artists, Brookman and, and Friedland in particular, exploit. So in the short story, Brookman describes a department store filled with celluloid or plastic objects, all of which are related to sexual identity or sexual practice. The first customer is a commander in the military, a high deputy to the government, who was given a quote unquote determining impression from a chamber pot in the quote unquote most delicate days of his youth. He's become, he fetishizes now chamber pots. And he suggests that the store must be then closed down. Uh, military invasion occurs and they must close the store down. The narrator demands to know why he earlier bought a chamber pot to satisfy his own desires and now wants to close the store and prevent others from realizing similar personal pleasures. He can only reply that he has been ordered to close the store to preserve the old, good, authentic birth, the alta authentische gute Geburt. No matter what happens, he or others my, no, no matter what happiness he or others might find through the auspices of the department store, such happiness cannot solve the problems of the modern nation state. He asked the narrator rhetorically, can we, for instance, fight war with this happiness? If everyone, as he pleases, shoots his semen wherever he, he wants instead of putting children into the world? Brookman's narrator engaging the military commander's insistence that war and non-reproductive sexual happiness are incommensurable suggests a radical solution. Using celluloid to produce children, celluloid kinder is the word, one word in German with a Z, who will grow up to be soldiers and hence who can satisfy both the state's need for reproductive sexuality and the department store's customers' desire for their fetish objects. So let me conclude here in this uh, very uh, disrupted presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Internet. So let me conclude here briefly by returning to my point in reading the avant-garde literary interventions by Solomo Friedlander and Till Bruchmann in relation to our contemporary efforts to dissenter German cinema. Really, my claim is, a, claim is a simple one. These authors indicate through their playful examination of celluloid, a fantastic projection or department store product in their, these fantastic creations, such as the, the, the projection or the department store product, that cinema thought in other ways, thought, thought as material object rather than visual spectacle, is a different cinema. There is for these authors no material affinity between cinema and film and national cinema or film and national identity as such. No German identity or Germanness inherent to the idea of cinema. But rather, Friedlander's and Brugman's stories remind us of the material pull of distraction and attraction, of the possibility that cinema can always take us somewhere else, to a different time and a different place, purposefully and always never quite German. Thank you so much. And Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Tom. Um, yeah, we, we lost you a few times, but you always came back. Let's see. That's <laughs> Keep on going. Um, Nahaki has pointed out in her inquiry into film history, and as this uh, conference has borne out, the very word German, Deutsch, or Old High, Theodest, derives from cross cultural transfer, meaning vernacular, it was coined in contradistinction to colonizing influence from beyond the local. The exclusionary use of Latin by the Christian missionaries, mimicked later by the secular elites use of French, eventually came to bar the 99% from access to legal, political, economic, cultural, and spiritual representation. At the same time, a minority and a majority culture, Deutsch as a cultural and linguistic practice itself lacks a center and was even defined in opposition to it. Likewise, we might see the national also as a dual practice. If cultural, economic and political isolation were the norm, nationalism would not make sense. It defines a group of people against others. It draws borders to control. This outward facing impetus has a similar domestic thrust. If people saw their interests represented in the cultural, economic and political systems that govern them, they would not need notions of the national to assert their right to self-determination and equity. Here, nationalism defends the majority interest against the minority's dictate. 
The nation state was born at the same time at which Karl Marx observed in his communist manifesto, the globalization of the capitalist economy and urged the proletarians of all countries to unite. Like Deutsch, nationalism is formulated at the intersection of several discourses. While it positioned itself against feudal rule and against global capitalism, it was co-opted by the feudal and the corporate castes to divide and rule and paradoxically to advance imperialist agendas. While nationalism configured itself as resistance against imperialism inside and out, it came to serve it inside and out. As such, it does not represent a center, but a battlefield on the open sea of contestation of where sovereignty should lie. Moreover, and perhaps more importantly, diaspora, migration, and transnationalism operate implicitly on the notion of crossing cultural boundaries. In re-examining concepts of the national, these discourses discern and expand on cultural distinction. It matters where you are from and it matters where you are because these coordinates delineate schemes of inclusion and exclusion that have wider social and political implications. The trajectory of these coordinates furthermore opens up questions as to where you will be. They ask about the future and underscore the potential of representation to shape it. In this sense, decentering the national upholds the validity and significance of concrete experience. It points to the often less than tangible bearing that prevailing representations have on the real. Minority discourses argue for representation. As such, they problematize what majority culture looks like and inadvertently take on the neoliberal modes of cultural production that once again shut out the 99% from access to representation. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, they affirm the importance of belonging as they highlight the disenfranchising or non-representation of entire groups of populations and their artistic and cultural expressions. With this charge, minority discourses claim that, to speak once again with Dunn, every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. While they may signal loss, their negative communicates the need to belong all the more powerfully. Moreover, they assert the right to belong in the specific coordinates of their particular trajectory. The amalgamation or hybridity of the cultures they combine maintains and forcefully re-inscribes specific cultural locations or dislocations as conferring valid identities. Hence, even when they mark absences or when they fuse or reinvent identities, they demarcate a local space or a plurality of local spaces that are configured as a source of individual artistic and political autonomy. Consequently, such discourse affirms the sense of self as anchored in a geographical, historical, and cultural set of coordinates rather than is free floating on the virtual sea of neoliberal non-belonging before too long going down as a footnote to history or into oblivion entirely. In fact, decentering discourse problematizes the notion of the national as insufficient to describe and legitimize actual experience and to qualify and give entitlement to the corollary social needs. It demands more specificity rather than seeking to dissolve specificity altogether. While disputing the cultural purity and hegemony of concepts of national identity, it calls out the imaginary quality. Its challenge of colonially informed prerogatives to civilize or in plainer language to rule and take brings home all the more the real effect of identity concepts. Its dislocations mean relocations which solidify rather than evaporate the significance of concrete coordinates. 
The decentering through diaspora, migration, and transnationalism is a countercurrent to a qualitatively new form of decentering that may wash together, that may wash away altogether what Don has called the continent. It is a decentering from within that dissolves coordinates and renders identity an impossibility. It turns representation into a matter of virtuality and virtuality only, disabling communicative platforms that could provide means to political consensus and intervention. Cutting the reference between signifier and signified, it disowns audiences of their history and their sense of place. In contrast to the problematization of national belonging through laws and through cultural hybridity that redraws continents and regrounds belonging, this neoliberal decentering subscribes to a new, albeit non-local, non-specific hegemony, which ultimately disenfranchises the local. If a cloud be washed away by the sea, to use once more Dunn's words, does not matter anymore because all and everything is liquefied anyway. As Sigmund Baumann describes in his series of books on the cultural, social, and economic effects of global neoliberalism, liquid modernity, liquid love, liquid times, liquid life. This new decentering is driven by the increased financialization of everything, including filmmaking. The investment-driven globalization of the film industry changes the medium. Indeed, as I argue in more detail elsewhere, it changes filmic language itself. Neoliberal culture has come to define film first and foremost as a financial vehicle. I think you've heard a lot in this conference about this. This definition focuses production on securing investment return. In the neoliberal context, film has become a financial equation that has academics and entrepreneurs alike searching for the optimal calibration of plot components, investment levels, and marketing strategies in order to achieve the highest possible profit margin. While calculating what assortment of plot elements will maximize audience appeal, it is geared towards the least common denominator in order to reach the highest degree of universality, which in the German context is defined as a human interest story. Hence directors such as Andreas Dresen, Wolfgang Becker and Florian Henke von Donnersmark all insist that their films could play anywhere because they tell universal stories. The films of others are not films about a minority. They are not films about East Germans. They are not films about particular historical coordinates. They are supposedly about everybody. And that is about no one in particular or rather the non-obliging, non-entitled, stateless, imaginary person hypothesized by the algorithm. This neoliberal concept of universality is different from the one Dunn had proposed as a covenant that offered belonging to all. For Dunn, universalism conceived in his day and age as the universal Catholic church means that the diminishing or exclusion of one potentially diminishes and excludes everyone. While Don's concept echoes throughout leftist thinking, from Marx to Rosa Luxemburg to Gerhard Gundermann's Aber Alle oder Keiner, but all or no one, the neoliberalist universalism abstracts from the particular. It is all but no one, everywhere, but nowhere in particular, and anytime but never. It is the politics of non-obliging that knows no continent, but only the open sea. As such, it crosses over disenfranchisement and its social, economic, and political effects. As the financial focus shapes the product, it sidelines producers and audiences alike, aiming for maximized market extension 
It adopts formulaic narrative strategies that do not require an artist with a vocation, a message, and creativity. Instead, it requires analysts and technicians. On account of investment risk, globalized film avoids aesthetic or political provocation. What Eric Rentschler has termed a cinema of consensus is a cinema of the bottom line, the commercialization of an artistic medium. According to Martin Scorsese, quote, the gradual but steady elimination of risk over the past 20 years has resulted in the disappearance of, quote, the unifying vision of an individual artist as the riskiest factor of all. Artists come with a trajectory, technicians come with a formula. The result is a cinema that has become predictable, a predictable commodity, quote, closer to theme parks than to film understood as art. Profit maximization derives from maximizing markets. It seeks to extend geographically vying for the global market and it seeks to extend in terms of product range and therefore creates what Stephen Heath has termed with respect to Hollywood cinema, the narrative image. For the purpose of merchandising, which we have heard about in this conference as well, film is foreshortened to an iconic moment or an iconic character. Hence, globalized film eschews particular histories and more indigenous perspectives that could complicate or contradict dominant narratives. History or local specificity is only relevant to the extent which it fits the formula. The same holds true for alternative aesthetic traditions, which could afford an alterity of vision. If employed at all, such aesthetics serve as decoration. They themselves turn into an orientalizing ornament that falls into the narrative economy rather than disrupting or undermining it. The confrontation with the unknown, with the open, with the resistant falls victim to the marketing machine which film serves and has itself become. There's no room for access or subtlety, for ambivalence or the jarring. Instead of evolving into a world cinema as envisioned by Dudley Andrews, Stephanie Dennison and Song Wee Lim, among others, global cinema hegemonizes and colonizes with a universal aesthetic and universal story that harkens back to Hollywood's global dominance. It empties space, place and time of meaning. Ultimately, this means there's no room for the audience itself. Where second and third cinema, as well as the hybrid cinemas of Eastern Europe, invited the participation of the audience in co-producing meaning, globalized film like Hollywood cinema follows a stringent narrative economy that leaves little room for interpretation. What you get is what you see. Indeed, it functions to an extent like the pharmaceutical industry, administering hormonal doses for a fee. By the same token, globalized film redefines cinema's relationship to its audience. Where spectators may have been partners in a communicative process, they are now customers. How many pay how much makes the headlines and eclipses the meaning of a film. While in other cinemas, hermeneutic agency translated into political agency, in globalized cinema, the lack of hermeneutic agency translates into the lack of political agency. As much as film professionals elsewhere, German pro film producers and filmmakers participate in the structural change. Film is an investment intensive medium and the level of investment often directly translates into the success of a film. Not always as we've seen in Evans' film talk, this in turn gives the filmmakers a more or less advantageous position to secure the next project. Besides, there's no alternative funding of adequate size. The increasing neoliberalization is traceable in the 20 years from the under Hausmann's 1999 Sonnenallee, Vaya Becker's 2003 Goodbye Lenin, and Henkel von Donnersmark's 2006 the Leben der Anderen, Two Treasons, 
2018 Gundermann. Increasingly, filmmakers have employed the aesthetic and narrative formula of global cinema, surrendering the cultural specificity and flagrantly commodifying their filmic subject. The distinctly different treatment of the East German legacy in these films draws out the decentering effect of globalization on national film industries. But for instance, both Sonnenalli and Gundermann are by East German directors on East German topics made with the explicit intent to valorize the East German legacy. The films differ greatly in both means and message. In 1999, Hausmann could still make a film that succeeded or because of cultural idiosyncrasies such as the East German joke structure, romantic irony, and references to DEPA films such as Konrad Wolf's Ich war 19 and Heiner Caro's Die Legende von Paul und Paula. By contrast, despite Dresden's artistic and political aspirations, his 2018 film closely resembles Brian Singer's 2018 biopic Bohemian Rhapsody and Dexter Fletcher's 2019 Rocketman, selling the East German singer-songwriter as yet another Freddie Mercury or Elton John. Moreover, it follows like Henkel von Donnersmark's 2006 Das Leben der Anderen, the pattern of Steven Spielberg's Schindler's List in portraying a perpetrator who is redeemed by the gratitude of his victims, for they recognize that he played the system. There is a contradiction between Trazen's claim, it should be allowed to have an Eastern view, to discounting the relevance of any such particularity of perspective and inserting the universality of his story. While Hausmann's film lampooned commodification by using Eastern products to caricature the Western advertisement style that with product placement has become a mainstay of global cinema, Dresden turns Gundermann into a commodified product that sold out his tour. While the film ostensibly portrays East Germany's most iconic most popular and most jaggedly resistant intellectual. Treason washes off any sharp edges with the formula of global cinema. Gundermann is reduced to another so-called human interest story and to the familiar redemption narratives. While the film pretends to promote local and minority culture, it sidelines that very culture for a chance to vie for the Oscar. Maximizing the film's global marketization outweighs the communicative needs of the community portrayed and even the communicative needs of the filmmakers themselves. At the same time, the film also pivots Dresden's career. Once committed to the unique, locally specific artistic legacy of DEFA and its implied political program, he now follows the trends of a commercially motivated cinema, I'm almost done, that aims at the widest market extension possible. Turning a formerly art-driven media into a marketing device, Gundermann shows that global neoliberalization affects the grammar of filmic language. With particular salience, global Gundermann marks the stakes of the media industry's globalized financialization. Over the course of the 12 years Dresden had to fight for the film's funding, his original intentions were decisively thwarted. Instead of problematizing the ways in which the othering of post-1990 historiography has affected Germany and its Eastern minority, the project turned into an orientalizing biopic that legitimizes Western colonialism. At the same time, it normalizes Eastern alternative by Eastern authority by casting it into the familiar formula of global cinema. Dresden's Gundermann evolved into a piece that the German state and its film industry eventually promoted with the 2019 German Film Prize in six categories. It has inverted in Dresden's own word to invert Dresden's own words more to do with Hollywood than with Hoyerswerda. Thank you.
Thank you, Evelyn. Um, and thank you, Tom and Kalani, for um, your papers as well. Um, we are here to uh, take questions. We have about 15 minutes. Um, so anyone should feel free to put those into the Q&A um, where I can see them and uh, ask them of our, of our panelists. Um, while we wait for those, we can also uh, open it to our, our other panelists as well, if, if um, any of you have thoughts about um, the rest of the panel. I have a question, I guess I can ask, start with Tom. I also have one for Evelyn. I found the presentation super interesting. Um, Tom, I wanted to ask about, because when you were talking about the Kittler passage and then the Friedlander passage, I really liked how you read them next to each other. Um, but I'm wondering if you could say something about rhetoric because it's, it's so important for Kittler. And I was wondering with that passage that you read about Friedlander, um, thinking about the, you know, how the Fata Morgana machine can somehow uh, deliver a kind of a, a national peace or something. I thought, is, is this a utopian rhetoric? Is it, did he believe in this rhetoric? What, what is the relationship between rhetoric and technology in, from what you've seen in, with Friedlander? Good question, uh, Kalani. Uh, Paul, can I take a pass? Is that <laughs> so tough. No, it's very good. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so the Kittler thing, I actually, with, with Friedlander, and I'll answer the question about the rhetorical implications, his work, Colin, you may know a bit about it already, uh, but his work was all about unification of, of sort of celebration of, of, um, of irresolvable unities. Uh, and that doesn't make any sense the way I just said it, but he was, he was a Dadaist, true and true, tried and true, and felt very much that duality um, was important to sort of his his worldview, so he wanted to make things so they weren't easily reconcilable. So, um, in, in that sense, he was not uh, the rhetorical idea that he was sort of striving for a unified nation. Even though I talked about De Neue Menschen and De Neue Gemeinschaft, those those ideas of unification, he thought they could only be achieved through polarity rather than sort of uh, a kind of dialectical. Uh, superimposition or a dialectical uh, kind of implosion of a thesis antithesis to a new whole. So he, he wanted to maintain, um, and that might have been as much a personal motivation as philosophical for him as, you know, his Jewishness is not talked a lot about in the literature that talks about him. Although I know we have a colleague in common at Minnesota who did work also on Friedlander. Um, and, you know, so it, the Jewishness doesn't get talked a lot about, and he's very marginalized uh, in a way, in the same way that Tristan Zara, who's well known uh, for those folks that are art historians and Dadaists, um, also is this amazingly transient, uh, marginalized figure within, within the European avant-garde from my perspective. So the rhetorical idea of a unified wholeness, again, and, and the part of the nation state and the global community, I'm not so on board uh, with that idea in the sense that we understand it as sort of explode, imploding things together to make a whole new whole. That said, the goal with Friedlander for me is really focusing on that material dimension of his work. I think it's it's not ironic that he's writing about celluloid and this, this mirage machine. And then Brookman is also writing about celluloid children later on. So there is something about the materiality of those terms. And by that, I mean the material of celluloid itself, which was still very much in flux as as the diversity of uh, material productive possibilities with this plastic thing and its residue that becomes film stock. So, um, but yeah, thank you so much for the nice question. Um, Kalani, I, I have a question for you. I, I think I'm thinking back to uh, Sarah's paper in the, in the previous panel um, and her considerations of, of uh, the work of media archeology span as a kind of uh, you know, approach to, to media history. Um, this, this project of Castard seems um, kind of aligned in spirit in some ways. Um, you know, so we've talked about media archeology span as a, as, a, as a scholarly methodology, um, but I'm wondering if you, if you could see Castard also as a, um, as a kind of aesthetic archeological project um, or if it's um, doing something something else uh, in, in kind of like uh, excavating the the uh, the mediations behind the art itself um, and what what goes on behind the scenes sort of yeah 
Yeah, no, that's interesting. I thought about this too. I really enjoyed Claire's paper and um, and thinking about that work from that theoretical framework. I would say for um, for Costa, uh, the issue is that he is uh, very willing to throw out technology that doesn't work and move on. And so this idea of media archaeology, in terms of I'm thinking like the the media archaeology book um, by UC Parica, for example, and others, um, quite often thinking about history, um, whereas Costar, I think, is very much thinking about future. And so he's one of the first people, for example, to experiment with uh, hybrid digital analog um, nonlinear editing systems. And so he already knew in the 70s when most, I think, when most filmmakers or I guess we can say conventional filmmakers, if we can still talk about that, are thinking about kind of celluloid. He, he is already seeing um, that the filmmaking direction is going is going on a completely different trajectory. Um, what's interesting is that he doesn't use, um, that he, he's very much interested in Super 8 rather than video. Um, but I think that's why this parallel story is um, told with Godard, who at the time with his production company, Sony Mash, was very much interested in video and the different kind of sequencing that happens with images in video, namely the simultaneity um, whereas Costar is still kind of interested in Super 8 at this moment that you think in the late 70s that he would already know that it uh, it kind of doesn't have the possibility because of all these technical difficulties um, to be distributed, to be exhibited um, in the kind of dream that he had already, you know, in the early 70s about Super 8. So I would think of him, I guess, less aligned with maybe a media archaeology trajectory and more in line with what people are calling now format studies. So thinking, because I think he is interested in Super 8 because of the, the cultural condition of that format and the kind of intimacy, the spontaneity, this is part of his project, this unscripted moment. And Super 8 has that home movie feel and it has that amateurism that for him is always so important. The diet, the kind of uh, the shift between professional and amateur uh, filmmaking and the kind of discourse and funding and institutional problems related to those two poles. So I think Super 8 for him, not just because of the, the material, but the kind of cultural connotations around the format is, is quite important. It's a great question. Thank you. I was thinking of the, um, the Antrag specifically also as a, as a, as a form, um, as a kind of yes. culture technique that, that yes. Uh, yes. You know, yeah, as you said, exists kind of in opposition or it's the kind of hidden um, uh, side that, that is not allowed to be mixed up with, a, with an, um, an authored piece of piece of work um, that, yeah. that you know, we, takes more importance when we're talking about industrial films or the kind of culture film that, that uh, Sarah was talking about as well. Yeah, I think especially but, now, oh, go ahead. Evan. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, but it's like very much written in the film, right? It's like the, the subtext of the film, which we don't get to see. It's like the iceberg that is underneath and that is like guiding this. As you can see, like in Gundermann, of course the film is something entirely different than what he set out to do when he started out. So that was a really lovely, yeah, correspondence. And I mean, I was wondering, Evelyn, too, if you, you said in the beginning that you have also written about the relationship between film funding and how that kind of changes film language. And I was really curious about that. And I think you said that I've written about it elsewhere, but I don't have time, but I wanted, I was uh, really interested to hear more about that. Um, yeah, it, that is very much on Gunnar. It's coming out. It should be out before the end of the year in the Edinburgh yearbook. Um, uh, it, it's a closer examination of Gunnarman. And um, I, I'm not sure how much I talk about in this paper about uh, Leander Hausmann, but he sort of, at the time when no East German filmmaker could make films, Hausmann slipped in uh, Son Ali, and that was because he was not perceived by the funding bodies as an East German. He had played in, you know, films of the cinema of consensus, sort of in, um, in um, um, comedies, a sort of a comedic character. He was at a theater in Bochum and he built this film very much as like a comedy. So I think the way he was able from his East German experience to sneak in this, because that's what he was before at the Deutsches Nationaltheater in Weimar. 
And so you always had to make an application for what you would show and they would just tell their funding buddies, whatever, and then just to put whatever on. And that's basically what he did with the film. But uh, Tresen could not do the same thing with his, with his film. So he was like for 12 years um, and negotiating and it changed very much. Like they, um, what they wanted out of this film. And it's like very interesting when you look at the DVD, it comes with footage from the same cameraman um, filming the open pit mines in which Gundermann worked. And there's footage in there that was part of his uh, diploma film at the East German Film School and compare that to the National Geographic type aesthetic that you have in the film itself. And you can see how it's, it maybe goes back to what uh, Evan talked about, like the, you have to market it to an international audience and that's what they are looking for. And it's like really interesting, even like for state funded bodies, even for public money, that is what they want because they, they are afraid of the experiment bringing out something else, something jarring, you know. And it's like also interesting, you know, like Trezen came to Gundermann already in the 1980s uh, through a film by Richard Engel, which was film, which was shot in East Germany, screened on East German TV. So something like was possible in East Germany to bring out about this very recalcitrant person who kept this recalcitrance like post 1990. And that's what made him so popular in the East. You know, that's what kept the interest of Tresen. And that's probably what made him think, oh, you know, I can sell this in the, maybe in the same way that, you know, um, Hausmann sold Sonnenallee because Hausmann's uh, film, I mean, it was popular in the West as well, but it was really the Eastern reception that made the film go through the roof. And uh, Gundermann is very popular in the East, but then he doesn't at all bring across what makes Gundermann so popular in the East, which is his belligerence, which is his like cutting edge, uh, like really like sharp uh, politics where he, you know, um, if you look at his songs, some of them, some of the more political songs aren't even like released on, on DVD, but you can find them on YouTube where he sort of declares war on the West, sort of. Uh, like a, a song about the Cold War where he then like sings like at the end of the Cold War, well, now I know why I would kill you, but I gave you my gun, so I only have my guitar. So like this, or like a film or a song about um, coming to the Oderbruch uh, into a NATO maneuver. Um, and the Oderbruch was like the garden of Berlin, like a very fertile land. So like this contrasting, uh, a metaphor of devastation now uh, laying to something that was very fertile before and things, you know, this is what the enemy looked like in my officer's handbook. So this very, the, he's uh, taking this out completely, what makes him so, um, I try to relate it with the jagged, you know, it's like really like sharp and there's just absolutely nothing in this. We are getting like this washed down uh, repentant, semi-repentant. I mean, he kept some of Gundermann's language. Gundermann wasn't actually repentant at all about the Stasi cooperation. He was like, you know, I did it and I got hurt as well. And that's just, you know, what we did. I mean, there, there isn't actually that in this. And I think that is actually what interested uh, Trezen originally in the film. I mean, it's, uh, that's what he states. That's what he states. He says there should be, a, that's how he reacts. Actually something that I haven't brought in. He reacts very, very strongly and fiercely against the lives of others. So he originally like meant to position his film against that film, wanting to bring the Eastern perspective in. But then in the end, he ends up doing the same thing. And it's like interesting, like you're talking about 12 years, right? This is like, entire regimes have gone in German history in 12 years. That's how long it takes to write the Antrag, you know? Yeah, I actually thought, you know, like your film, I was like, you know what? Actually more interesting than seeing Gundermann would be a film about Tresen writing Antrag of the Antrag of the Antrag of the Antrag. Yeah, it would be like, 
from patchels. I mean, this was so fascinating. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. It's really great. Perfect timing. Um, thank you all again.